This is a video about characters, how they are encoded, how they are printed on a screen, and what you should be aware of when dealing with them. And this is a terminal emulator. It is the software version of a physical terminal, which was roughly a screen with a keyboard. Terminals are sometimes called teletypewriters, or TTY. Historically, TTY were typewriters used in telegraphy. The term terminal refers to an endpoint of a communication channel. And terminals were used to communicate with computers. To communicate using electrical signals, we need to encode characters into a binary format, meaning that we need to associate a binary number for each of our characters in a character set. The first binary format was the Bodo code. It was a 5-bit code representing letters, numbers, and a few punctuation marks. It was later modified by Murray, who reorganized it and added control characters, which are special characters to control terminals like the carriage return, the line feed, and the bell, which still exist and can be used to make my terminal make this annoying sound. In the 60s, IBM created the extended binary coded decimal interchange code, or FCDIC which was an 8-bit character encoding. They actually made a lot of different character encodings that they called cut pages. To address the growing need for a standardized way to represent characters across different computers, the American Standard Code for Information Interchange, or ASCII, was created. ASCII encodes 128 characters on 7 bits. But most computers use a minimum of 8 bits to encode information. So a lot of extended ASCII encoding came to life. Every system, every nation, every language got its own, which made communicating with each other difficult. The Japanese even created the word mojibake to refer to the problem of using the wrong character encoding to decode a text. With the increase in communication, the word needed to share universal command encoding, able to represent every languages and characters in the world. So, in 1991, the Unicode standard came to life. Originally, Unicode was designed as a pure 16-bit encoding, able to encode 65,536 characters. Each character is given a name and a number, called a code point. The set of all code points is called the Unicode code space. But it became clear that 16 bits were not sufficient, and in 1996, the Unicode code space was extended to include integers from 0 to 0x10fffff, where 0x10fffff is a 21-bit number. This is 1,114,112 different possible values. As of Unicode version 15.1, only 149,813 characters exist. Unicode is just a standard. It defines the characters and gives them a number. It does not define how the number should be encoded in the binary format. To do that, we usually use UTF, which stands for Unicode Transformation Format. It gives algorithmic mapping from every Unicode code point to a unique byte sequence. The most famous ones are UTF-8, 16, and 32. The number following UTF is the code unit. It represents the minimum amount of bits used to encode one character. UTF and Unicode are not separated. And the reason why Unicode is 21 bit long comes from UTF-16. The first version of Unicode had about 7,000 characters. Each character was given a 16 bit number, which was directly encoded as it. However, 16 bits only allowed for 65,536 characters. To allow for more characters, a small portion of the 16-bit block got reserved for surrogates, which are special code points made to represent characters with number higher than 65,535. This portion is split in two, one for the leading or high surrogates, the other for the trailing or low surrogate. Each of these two parts contains 1,024 values which can be represented by 10-bit long numbers. 
In UTF-16, we create a pair of surrogates by taking one of each, which means that we can code up to over a million characters. If we add up the initial 65,536 of the 16-bit block to the previously found number, we get 1,114,112. So we can code up to the number 10FFFF, which can be represented by 21 bits. But in reality, because computers only like multiples of 8, we never use 21 bits to encode Unicode characters. I mean, you can do it. You can create your own UTF-21. UTF-32 uses 32 bits to encode every single Unicode character, which has the advantage to be easy, but the disadvantage of being wasteful. With UTF-16, we need one or two 16-bit numbers to encode characters. For the first 65,000 characters, we only need two bytes. For the rest, we need four bytes. Because the algorithm is simple, let me teach you how to convert a code point into its corresponding UTF-16 encoding. If we take the bread emoji with the code point U plus 1F35E or 0X1F35E, we first need to subtract 0X10,000 to it, which gives us 0XF35E. We convert the result to a 20-bit number, then split it in half. Each one of these halves are used as an index to select a surrogate. The first half is used to select a high surrogate. The second half is used to select a low surrogate. Now that we have our pair of surrogates, we store them into two 16-bit numbers and that's it. UTF-16 is used by JavaScript strings. So in JavaScript, the bread emoji has a length of 2 and we can get the values which is computed using the code point add method. UTF-8 is the most commonly used UTF encoding. Like UTF-16, it's a variable length encoding, where a character can be encoded with one or up to four bytes. UTF-8 is memory efficient and backward compatible with ASCII. To be able to know how many bytes a character is encoded with, UTF-8 defines some bit patterns if the first byte starts with the zero, then only one byte is used and the remaining seven bits are used to encode the character. This makes it indistinguishable from ASCII. Here we encoded the character lowercase a. If the first byte starts with two one and a zero, the character is encoded using two bytes. And the second byte must start with the sequence one zero. The remaining 11 bits are used to encode the character which in this case is the code point 00BD, which is the fraction 1 half. If the first byte starts with 3 1 and a 0, it means that the character is encoded on 3 bytes, and the following 2 bytes will start with 1 0. The remaining 16 bits are used to encode the character, which is BE75, corresponding to the Korean label for bread. By now, I hope you start to see the pattern. If the first byte starts with 4, 1 and a 0, 4 bytes are used to encode the character and the 3 following bytes must start with 1, 0. The rest of the bits are used to encode the character, which in this example is the bread emoji. Technically, we could add more bytes, but because of UTF-16, which has over 1.1 million possible values, UTF-8 only needs 4 bytes to encode all possible values. In the Rust programming language, strings are always valid UTF-8. Because of that, you can't index them. You need to use a method like cars. This is also why the primitive type car takes 4 bytes. One more thing to be aware of is the idea of grapheme cluster. There are certain sequences of Unicode characters that should be treated as one visual unit. It means that some visual characters can be made out of several Unicode code points. This is great to make kaomoji or some fancy word, but it can create problems when the same visual character can have multiple Unicode representation. For example, in JavaScript, if you try to compare these two visual characters using the triple equal sign, it returns false. 
So instead, you should use a method like local compare, which returns zero, meaning that these two strings are equal. And I've been talking about characters this whole time without really defining them. A character is a symbol. It's an abstract ID. Unicode uses the term abstract characters. A specific graphical representation, an image, a drawing of a character is called a glyph. One character can have an unlimited amount of glyphs associated to it. Glyphs do not necessarily correspond one to one with characters. Multiple characters can be associated to a single glyph. Or a single character can be associated to multiple glyphs. A collection of glyphs is called a typeface or a font family. Most typefaces include variations in size, weight, slope, width, and so on. Each of these variations is called a font. Fonts are implemented using files. There are different types of font formats. The most basic ones are called bitmap fonts. The idea behind bitmaps is to represent the screen as a screen of bits that you can turn on or off to make an image. These were the type of fonts used by text mode terminals to show characters on the screen. When it comes to computer displays, we distinguish between two modes, text mode and graphic mode. In text mode, the screen is represented by a uniform rectangular grid. Each cell of this grid can contain one character. For example, the VGA text mode typically divides the screen in 25 rows and 80 columns. To print a character on the screen, we use a 25 by 80 array called the VGA text buffer. This array stored inside the VGA card's memory is mapped to a specific address in the computer's RAM. So reading or writing to that address don't access the RAM, but directly access the text buffer on the VGA hardware. Each element of this array contains two bytes. The first one represents the character that should be printed on the code page 437 character set, which is an extended ASCII character set. The second byte defines the foreground and background colors, and if the character should blink. The big advantage of text mode is its low memory consumption. For 25 by 80, 2 byte array, it requires only 4000 bytes of memory. When memory became bigger and cheaper, it became possible to store the values of every single pixel of the screen. Hence, in graphic mode, we store the color of every single pixel in a flat array called the frame buffer. With this finer control, we can draw a wider range of shapes, we can draw lines and curves. And when it comes to fonts, bitmap are great, but they are hardly scales. Now, fonts file don't tell which pixel to turn on or off, but describe how glyphs should be drawn. For example, the true type font or TTF format uses a combination of straight lines and Bezier curves to describe the outline of characters. So when you want to print text on a screen, you first need to load a font, then you have to transform the text into its pixelized representation, give it a position, and finally render it on a screen. We've spent quite some time talking about characters, but we've barely scratched the surface. Because they are everywhere, computer scientists developed some interesting algorithm that I want to cover in my next videos. So if you want to see them, consider subscribing. Thanks for watching.